Woohoo! Excellent. Oh, take two. Hello, and <laughs> welcome back to another episode of Controllers and Couches. I'm Full Metal Chicken. And I'm Steph. For the second time. In case you're wondering why we're saying second time, is essentially we were recording and it dropped. Um, <laughs> we were like a quarter of the way into the podcast. Yeah, thanks to a Windows update. That you told not to automatically update. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that kind of uh, crashed the whole operation. Yeah, so, anyways... Uh, life update. Hi, how you Hi, doing? Hi, I'm good. I had a cookie today. Ooh. And then maybe like a bowl of chocolate mousse, which yeah. I've been, I've only been eating for like the last week. Uh, it's gone now. Yeah. It's gone now. Yeah. I ate it all. All the chocolate. I'm mm. full of chocolate now. You made a um, apple crumble yeah. instead, I've upgraded to apple crumble. Yeah. I put orange juice in it. I actually could taste it and I liked it. Um, what I think we should do next time is actually get fresh oranges and put a bit of rind. Yeah. As well. Yeah, that'd be cool. More like a citrusy kind of. Yeah, not much. Just a little. Just, just hint. to take a hint, like even like if we grate the, the yeah. orange and then like sprinkle it over. Yeah, yeah like just a zest. A, bit, a slight. A zesty apple. Yeah, thing. not. Well, I'm saying I'm not saying like the whole skin of an orange. But yeah. Um, life update. Uh, we got our PO box yesterday. Yep, that'll be fun. Which um, means we're one step closer to ordering. Stuff. <laughs> this one on yeah. Scientology 10 book series. Um, that book that I said hadn't been shipped yet from the last podcast ended up getting shipped two hours after we finished recording the podcast. Yep. Which is great. It's supposed to come from the UK here sometime by the end of this week. If not, I'm sure it'll be here early next week. So, yeah. Like, yeah. And uh, you've been reading anything... Lately, interesting. Um, I finished the silo, you know the uh, the silo trilogy that you yeah. got me. I had the two books left, book two and book three. Um, can say it's a bit like they were like, oh, it's the next Hunger Games. I would say it was more like a Divergent ripoff. Yeah. To be honest, but look, it was okay. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't fantastic either. Um, I'm also reading the Talon. It's called a Talon Saga, but it's five YA books in the series. And I've completed, I finished book three today. I can tell you didn't need to be five books already. So it's pretty bad. I wouldn't say it's bad. It's pretty good. Like, book one was okay. So the premise is um, there's dragons, right, that have been hunted by humans. Yeah. So what they've done is they've created themselves a human form. Ooh, interesting. So that way they can run around like little humanoids to avoid detection and stuff. Then, of course, it's a YA, so you're going to get this one rebel girl who, you know, holds the key to the whole society and yep. all that kind of thing. And then you also have the perspective of um, the, what do they call them? Um, I can't remember. Which saint is it the one that kills the dragons in all the churches in the icons? Saint that kills, is it George? Yeah, St. George, the dragon slayer. Big shield. Yeah, St. George. Do you remember this? Because it's literally printed in every orthodox... Yeah, it is St. George. And it, I was like, what is this creepy stuff? Um, and so there's also this society, the Brotherhood of... Um, the uh, the Brotherhood of St. George, and they go around in the human soldiers that are handpicked to f- kill and slay dragons, essentially, yep. right? And so you can tell where I'm going for this. Yeah. There's this one super soldier, best soldier, teenage boy that they've never, you know, one in a billion super soldier boy, and they need him because the girl, obviously, it's YA, right? And she's a young girl, and they need an operative that is more believable. Yeah. And so they have to go around and try and sniff out for her and slay her and blah, oh, blah, blah. Geez. And so you can see where this is going. I'm not going to spoil it for anyone. Basically, it is five books long. I've read the first three books. Book one is like, it's an interesting premise. You get into it and you go, okay, that's pretty solid. Book two, I was like, yeah, yeah, like I'm into this. All right. Book three, and I was like, predictability. Yeah. And so I'm going to finish that series this week as well as um the audiobook that for the third book in the infernal devices trilogy it has to go back in four days so i have to finish that tomorrow nice. start and finish it's gonna be like 10 hours of solid listening so that's it sorry i did not mean to knock the table there everyone but, uh, uh, that's it for me yeah all i've been listening to is the black prison by brent weeks 
Yeah, we got that as an audible book of the month. Yeah, so I'm listening to that at the moment. I haven't really been reading much. Um, Because basically I've just been doing the the World of Tanks and Call of Duty. But I was thinking about maybe playing some Assassin's Creed tonight. Maybe bust out Odyssey and see how that goes. Woo! So, uh, yeah, you know, do some shipping. Literally. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah, talking about shipping, um, tonight's uh, BuzzFeed quiz is... What kind of personality matches your bacon? <laughs> but the actual title is, it's time to find out what type of bacon matches your personality. So... January is a very brunchy month. Yes. Because people are like slowly getting back into work. Everyone wants to brunch, you know. Yeah. So do you have any idea I of... I swear that was the freezer. <laughs> That's funny. Ice dropping. Um, so do you have any idea what you might be? <laughs> We've taken this quiz already, yeah. so I'm not going to spoil it. Yeah. Um, it dropped, so... Yeah, we know. Uh, let's make it look legit, though. Yeah. Pick a colour. Pick a colour. Blue? Oh, let's, red, I'm going to change it up this purple. time. No, answer it honestly. Okay, so I'm going to go blue. I'm going to go red. Okay, what drink would you enjoy with breakfast? I'm going to go coffee. Uh, so the options are water, coffee, milk, or orange juice. Orange juice. Not... Yeah, yeah OJ, not Simpson. It depends what I'm having for breakfast, and it depends if I'm in a rush or not, and it depends if I've brushed my teeth or not. If I'm not in a rush and I haven't brushed my teeth, it's orange juice. Yep. Um, which pet do you prefer? Dogs, cats, goldfish, no pets, llamas. But llamas, llamas aren't, aren't there. On the list. I'm going to go cats. I, I said before that I was devastated that rabbits weren't on the list, so I'm also going to go cats. Yep. And then what's your go-to shoe? Do you have bands? Do you have Converse high heels or sandals? Um, I'm Converse. Yeah, I'm going Converse. Um, also, can I just say as a side note, I saw this meme the other day where the Vans logo is supposed to be the V is a square root and the ANS is answer. Yep. So the v logo square is... square root answer. I did not know that. Yeah. Changed my life. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And then which uh, phone do you prefer? You've got Android, iPhone, Samsung, Google Pixel. And my question before was, aren't Samsung's and Google Pixel's Android operating phones, but that's a different story. Yep. I'm an iPhone person through and through. Yeah, I'm going Samsung. So, uh, you have an iPhone. I know. The iPhones work better for you than any Samsung ever could. Thank you very much. And then we have a pick a Zodiac sign. You've got a Virgo, you've got a Taurus, a Capricorn, and a Scorpio. There's no give way or a stop. So uh, I'm going Virgo. Um, there's no Aries here, so I can't go for that. Uh, I have family that are Virgo, Taurus, and Scorpio, so I most identify and appreciate Virgos just because of how, like, by the book they have to be, you know. And then we get to choose a Netflix original series. So we have Stranger Things, The Crown, House of Cards, Big Mouth, No SpongeBob. So I'm going Stranger Things. I've never seen... Oh, actually, tell a lot. I think we've seen the first 20 minutes of the first episode of House of Cards. Yeah. I've never seen Big Mouth. I know that everyone says they're both fantastic series. Season one of Stranger Things was phenomenal. Season two was pretty good. Three was a waste of my time. I'm going to go with The Crown. Yep. And then we have Choose an Artist. So we've got Ariana Grande, Big Time Rush, Sean Mendes, and Conan Gray. And I'm going to go Big Time Rush. I would have gone Big Time Rush. But I only like one song from them. Yep. And that's the duet that they did with um, Jordan Sparks. So I'm going to have to go Ariana. Cool beans. Then it says, choose some breakfast. So essentially what we've got in the first box is strawberry juice beside fruits on top of the table. Just like some raspberries, some mandarin, pineapple, pineapple. strawberries, bananas. Yep. But then you got... Pancakes on a palte, <laughs> but it's actually pancakes on a plate. With some butter on top and some syrup. Yeah. I wonder if that's motor oil. Most likely. Probably Valvoline. You know what I mean. Some strawberries and some blueberries. Then you've got a square waffle with straws. Um, blueberries and some dusted icing sugar, I think. Yeah, and then it says donuts with cream, but they're actually bagels. So, yeah, I'm going pancakes. It depends on what, where I am, if I'm at home, in a rush or whatever. If... I was like in a rush, general day to day thing. I would go for the bagels. Hmm. So I ended up in Canadian bacon. Yep, which so, is what we predicted for you in the start of the last exactly. recording. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm different from the bunch and a little less traditional. Uh, I can be cut thick or thin, but no matter what, everyone still loves me because I'm Canadian bacon, eh? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
I got pancetta, so I'm pancetta. a bit hard to digest because of my bold attitude. But I pair well with others. Like and, Canadian bacon. Uh, I've never had pancetta before, so. Yes, so interlude <laughs> by someone speeding and hitting the horn. Okay. Um, so on the bacon side of things, movie reviews. Anything up there worthwhile watching? We haven't watched any movies since the last episode. We all shows we started, um, I think it was like up to episode three of Lost in Space season two. Yep, we uh, watched or re watched Rick and Morty season four. We you're st- re watching it. We started the gloaming on the Stan. Um, essentially, we got up to episode two, yeah, which is good. Some of these nice, real sort of aerial pan shots for Tasmania, really cool. Beautiful Doesn't even come across as an Australian film, it comes no. across more British, which yeah. is good. Um, but that's pretty much it, yeah. For me. And TV shows, we've got, yeah, a few to watch. We've got a new Dracula series as mm-hmm. well. That looks promising. Um, it'd be interesting to see if it follows closely to Bram Stoker's sort of Dracula. But, you know, that'd be interesting. You showed me um, the V Wars. Yeah, so V Wars. What's his name? Uh, the guy who plays Damon Salvatore in the in Summer Holder. So it'd be interesting to see. Like, I'm surprised he went for another dragon kind yeah. of show. Showed out of that. But um, you were talking about... Tw- what was the other movie you were saying came out? Ah, uh, Knives Out. Yeah. So um, apparently that's pretty good. So we might go see that. Um, and I heard that there's this good ice skating series, season one, called Spinning Out. It's supposed to be like a soapy emotional drama thing. Hmm, interesting. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it, I guess. Cool beans. Yep. What's next, Fan? Week ready for our weekly news wrap up? Uh, yep, do it. Um, so first and foremost, with everything going on, I, again, wanted to plug, if you are living in a bushfire kind of advice zone or whatever, um, everyone seriously just get on and head over to www.register.redcross.org.au. So basically, um, you can use this to, this website to let your family and friends so they can search for you. Um, within the specific fire events and locations to kind of track you to see if you've left or not. Um, Because obviously with a lot of cell towers being burnt out and whatnot, it's really hard to track 30,000 people, you know, over the hundreds of hectares that are being burnt. So please, if you have a chance, register. We're not getting paid or anything like that, obviously. This is uh, just uh, an initiative of the Australian government. Mm-hmm. And um, it's also Red with Cross Oz. Red Cross Oz, and so essentially, yeah, just register, find, reunite. Um, no fee, anything like that. No, it's, it's just yeah. It's purely just a uh, little information to get people across the line uh, if they need be. Yeah. And the other thing I suppose is what everyone is sort of going through at the moment, New South Wales and Victoria, is an absolute firestorm. Firestorm, and we've got so much smoke that in certain areas it's up to like I think what. 2,000 parts per million or something crazy and we were actually driving in it the other day and we had to put fog lights on and switch over to internal air and yeah, cycling because it was that bad you couldn't see 100 meters in front of you now that's the point where you kind of go what the hell's going on and you know it's really eye-opening to actually get out and drive around and see what's happening because so it was a blanket cute. you see all these animals and they're just out in paddocks and they're just Covered in smoke. Yeah. It's like a it, just pea soup fog. That is how much smoke there's, you know, the, the, the you it's know, there's out there. Yeah. And it's just, um, what you need is a wind change. It's crazy. Pretty much. And again, uh, if you find yourself able to donate, please consider donating to whatever state fire service you feel like, whatever kind of animal um, welfare fund. Uh, any farmer's donation thing, you literally just have to Google whatever you feel like and it'll come up because there are so many people donating yep. if you find yourself in the position to. We did it the Whittlesey CFA. So yeah. And really also, um, just be aware that there has been a spate of people door Donating knocking goods. or door knocking in yeah. CFA yellows. So They will never door knock? No, they don't door knock. So if you have anyone... Uh, door knocking and see if they yellows or you see anyone doing that call the police because they're being fraudulent yeah um the cfa do not do that um they essentially have their own hotlines and everything so if you see that um contact uh, the police police or crime stoppers um and try and get a photo of them yeah too 
or kind of like sadly get their ID and be like, oh, dude, can I have your phone number? Because I've got a ton of other friends that would love to donate. Yeah. Um, but also, from what I've been reading online, they're less, because they've been inundated with actually like food and all other goods, they're asking for um, monetary. Like, yeah, just monetary yeah. donations. Um, so a lot of, if you have a specific CFA in your area, they're more likely to have a Facebook page um, and they advertise all of their, like I know a lot of ones in our area advertise their BSP and their actual account number. Otherwise, just feel free to call the station. There's generally someone there or you can leave a message or um, Facebook them or email them if there's one specific one in your area that you'd like to donate to um, to get their account number to transfer money to. So but Yeah, the, uh, the smoke's pretty bad at the moment. And uh, yeah, it's got so bad, in fact, that uh, the smoke's reached parts of South America. So that's... And we're talking about places that are like Chile, Argentina, Uruguay. These are like more than 12,000 kilometers or 7.5 thousand miles. Yeah, which is away just from ridiculous. The fires, you know? Yeah. The other thing is like you think about, say, for instance, what gets carried on the wind. To put things in perspective, say, for instance, if there was radiation fallout, this oh, yeah, is... it would be stuffed. It'd be you'd global. be stuffed. So this, you can actually see what kind of fallout would arise. So it is catastrophic and like people who say that it's not you know there's a lot going on it's it's horrible oh it's just like i was watching this this morning was when the interview was or overnight i guess you could say for us and all right pierce morgan is very problematic in his own bullshit and i'm not going to deny that i'm not saying that this is his saving grace but he was on um was it Kelly casey or some shit like that yeah some australian mp who's obviously in the liberal team um, no disrespect to the Liberals, but he's part of the Liberal camp, if you will. Um, and so he was on the, whatever the Good Morning Britain version of, you know, breakfast television there is, I think. And so, also that's not me farting, that's my jeans across the chair. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, so they were doing like a broadcast interview with this Australian minister, like, uh, Minister of Parliament, Member of Parliament. And so they were talking about the fires. And so this guy is essentially was an absolute asshole, this Australian minister. And he was like, oh, nah, climate change is fine. You know, these fires happen and you're with a girl. Yeah. And so she went out and she actually put herself a tweet and she was like, um, I'm not just some weather girl. Like, I'm like you who's a cabinet maker before you know accepting coal money uh i've got a degree i've worked for this amount of years you know doing weather yeah. forecasting and i worked for the raf and i did all this other stuff and i'm up to date with the latest science research i'm an actual because she has a degree and she said uh what was it meteorology and physics or something yeah. Like that. So she knows a whole lot more about it than you do dude no you know disrespect but also disrespect because you're a sexist asshole but that's a different story Yep, which is ridiculous. But he went off Piers Morgan, and I'm not saying that this was his saving grace at all. I'm just saying I appreciated it for what it was. Yeah, absolutely. And also to that fiery who said, uh, is a prime minister in town? Tell him to get the fuck out of yeah. Nungallon or whatever the town was. Good on yeah. you, sir. Yep, good on you. Thank you for your service. Yep. And like we went yesterday, and I didn't even know what to say. Yeah, it's like... When we know, did the donation, it's like, how can you say to... How do you say, look... Thank you for what you do. Yeah, you just... How can you adequately convey how grateful you are? Yeah, because at the end of the day, they're, they're doing this voluntary. They can potentially lose their own homes and their own well, lives. Their own jobs. It's... So fighting you know, fires. It's a, it's a tough gig. And so. you hear this new bullshit where ScoMo, Scummo, Scotty from marketing, was like, oh yeah, um, we're going to pay them up to $4,000 of... Like, their wages, because they're, they're obviously volunteers. Yeah. Right? And it's like, you dickhead, some of these people have been taking time off work since September to fight these fires. Um, and we're not saying that ScoMo should be there with the fucking fire hose in hand. But $4,000 is what one person may make in a week. So, yeah. Or, so not a week, like a month or whatever. Yeah. These are people who may have families or kids to support. Yeah. And they've got nothing. It's, um, it's sad. It's... Yeah, there should be better funding and for the CFA. climate management, to be honest. Exactly. And what's the next step for Australia? Like, 
the bushfires are always going to be a thing with the weather we're experiencing and weather patterns and just the extensive drought we have, right? Forcing bushfires essentially because there's just so much tinder around. Yeah. Are we gonna we're gonna have to change our lifestyles and we're gonna have to change our architecture. We're gonna have to find some building mechanism that is nowhere near as flammable. No. Does that mean we're gonna have to start like living underground? And so how far underground do you have to live? I don't know, it's like like more like you just live in a bunker. You'd have to live in a bunker. It's really scary. It is scary. It's ridiculously scary. You watch the shit on the news and you can't comprehend it's happening on your planet, let alone a two-hour drive away from you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you can't comprehend it. It's just, yeah. And also, when you see the, the temperatures that most of these fires are getting to, and people who have, you know, set up their own fire breaks and you know, this house is you know able to withstand x amount of heat and, mm. brrr, and you see it just gone it's just ridiculous and people's like alloy wheels melt at like 660 yeah. degrees celsius so yeah that's pretty hot pretty shocking too and uh, yeah some of these cars too if you see if, like just for instance if you see a car that's on fire the actual window lining don't touch it even with you got you know you need particular gloves because what will happen is the chemicals in the actual lining of the window will they're, they're porous so they'll go through the gloves they'll go through your skin and, and because they're calcium binding they'll dissolve the calcium within your bones that's this that's also scary reminds me, sorry to take a detour but reminds me that um go to was it scotty's dash cams or was yeah. it aussie dash cam dash cams australia where the Prius overheated with the electrical failure. Yeah. And, and the, the poor guy, he had to pull over the side of the road because it like he's under the bonnet. It's like you can see smoke. He pulls over. Then you see like flame tongues. Yeah. And they're coming out. And then he's like, oh shit. And he gets out to obviously get a um, fire extinguisher. And then so the fire goes down while he's out to get the extinguisher. And you're like, oh, it's fine. It's over. And then it really. Yeah. Like, and then you up. see the post sort of shot and it's just. You know. And literally, there are like people. No one's called Triple O. No. The people are driving away, and anyone who's walking on the side of the road has just their phone bloody video taping it. Call the fucking fire brigade, you dickheads. Yeah, so that was stupid. Mm. So, uh, yeah, lots and lots of fires. Fire is definitely, you know, the key flavor of the month at the moment. Can I know one more thing about the fires because this shit has me heated. Yep. Um, so I think it was Sunday night. And I briefly told you what it was about. So I was in the middle of working on my thesis. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take a like, two-minute toilet break. So I'm sitting in the toilet doing my thing. And I have my phone. And for anyone who knows me, I like looking at pictures of candles. Yeah. I like want to start making candles on the side. Just as a hobby, not for financial reasons. If I got good at them, people said they were good maybe in like five years. But yep. I, like, I like looking at candles and I like artisan candles and... Blah, blah, blah. And so I was looking at them earlier in the day. So I log on Instagram to stalk my friends, see what everyone else is doing. And then I get this um, targeted advertisement where there was some woman um, who was selling candles, right? Yeah. But she was selling them in a very disgusting manner. So her post, like it was a paid promotional post. And she used the hashtag Australia is burning because that was the top trending hashtag of essentially that fortnight. And everyone was liking pictures about... So essentially, if you had liked a certain amount of pictures, I think the limit was two or three. Yeah. um, Pictures where or interacted with posts that had the hashtag Australia is burning, you would have gotten this um, promotional, like paid promotion photo advertisement um from her post if that makes any sense whatsoever right yeah and so it came up for me and i was like reading it and she goes in and she's oh 450 million animals have died um candles something about her candles and how she's going to donate 10 percent of her candles literally that's how choppy the paragraph was right she's going to donate 10 percent of her candle sales um, to the Wild Care Fund. And then, oh, candles, and they're lovely. And my friend is also running a similar promotion for 20%. Once you've done checking me out, go check her out, you know? Yep. And then all the... Ha- hashtag Australia is burning, hashtag apocalypse bullshit, right? And then hashtag candles and her company hashtag and her boutique hashtag. And I, 
I'm sorry, I got heated. Yeah. So I private messaged her and I said, look, um, I'm sorry, but why are you trying to cash in on the Australia is burning hashtag to sell more stuff? And then she went off and I just said to her, look, no disrespect. If you had have been respectful, if you had come across in a way that said, you know, I'm looking to raise money to donate. However, the only way I can feasibly do that is by selling more candles. That I'm going to donate 10% better. if, you know, otherwise, if you don't want to buy from me, please feel, you know, spend that money, donate it to the wild care fund that she had optioned, right? Or um, you can also do it with my friend's store, yeah. right? Do you know, I would have been a sucker and I would have fucking bought $400 of candles because that's the kind of person I am, right? Yeah. But she had to go about it in such a shit bloody way and then she goes on attacking me and I'm like, that's literally not what anyone was saying. What no. we were saying was you can't freaking drive your own personal gain and disguise it as you're going to donate, yeah. If you're not actually going to. Exactly. And so I just got so heated and then she blocked me. But it's okay because I literally have three other burner accounts. And I was like, oh, well, fair enough. And one of my friends was saw it as well. And she was like, this is absolutely shit. And then so she also messaged this woman. And she's gone, you don't know my, you know, you don't know about me. You don't know about my business. How dare you tell other people about me? And it's like, woman. She also saw the Instagram post. Yeah. She also got recommended the post. It wasn't just me, thank you very much. This other person did it out of their own bloody volition. Um, and then so she's like, you don't know anything about me or about my business. And then so you go on and you find no disrespect to her. But like, you go through her business, you, find, you Google her business, it comes up with her shop that she's opening, it came up with her ABN, and this silly woman has her full name. On her Jeez. ABN, she had her phone, her mobile phone number on her ABN. She had, like, um, her home address That's registered instead of, like, a PO box or her actual store, like, her original store that she has. And she was going off at me as, like, and she was trying to pass it off as if, like, no disrespect, every town, there are actual towns that are actually burning, right? Yeah. There are towns that are close to the fires and the next in line. And then there are people like me. I live in fucking Melbourne. I'm not going to say, oh my God, the fire's affecting me the most. Yeah. Right? That's what the fuck she was doing. And she was acting like the fire started. She actually said the fire started in her town. And then when you look at the map, right? And you can find her on Facebook. So you can find which town she's actually from. And it's nowhere fucking near. Just fucking say, look, if you're actually doing it honestly... Say, either buy my candles so I can actually use that money to donate, but I need to sell more candles to be able to donate more money. Yeah. Or, if you don't want to buy from me, donate to this bloody fund. Get your finger out of your ass and do something for the environment and exactly. for the animals. Don't fucking milk it for what it was. Any mahoozle, sorry for that rant. Please be sure to let... Like, what's your opinion on the matter? I think now is not the time to be taking advantage to make money. And if someone's going to be only donating 10%, that's where you kind of go, okay, well, I'm going to be donating 80% because at the end of the day, I understand that people are going to have to cover their costs. Two things to say. In her fucking candles, she's putting in fucking Australian plants. You don't put Australian plants like that. She has eucalyptus leaves in her fucking candles, Which embedded is... in her candles, right? And number two, do you know how much your fucking candles go for? $39.95 for the cheapest yeah. one, Right. So that means that she's only doing four dollars. And I know people are going to say to me, Steph, but soy wax is expensive. But no disrespect, but I've bought premium soy wax. Yeah. I have the whole kit that I've you know acquired of like a hundred essential oils and other fragrance scents. I and the wax wicks and all that and the wood wicks and all that shit. So I know it's an expensive thing. But for forty dollars, all she has to do is like sell two, three candles. Yeah. And that whole thing. It's... Like, she's reached a profit margin. Yeah. Based on the, the amount that she happens to be selling. And her fucking reviews are also skewed because she and her friends that are living in the area have their small businesses, right? And so the nail salon has bought some candles to sell through their nail salon. So they gave her a fucking stellar review. The hair salon that's on the exact same strip as where her original store is has bought her candles to sell through the, hair, the nail and hair salon, right? Yeah have bought candles to sell through their shops 
and they gave her fucking stellar reviews. It's... And then if you go through her Facebook, because none of these people have fucking private settings, all of her friends, her best friends, that she posts in every day, they are the people, because she's first name, last name, and shit, that have left these fucking stellar reviews. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. So, uh, yeah, no. There should be something, you know, to say about that. Alright, sorry. I'm going to yeah. shut up about it. And now we're going to talk about the new Sony PS5 logo. Yeah. <laughs> I wish that the 5 looked more like the first S. Yeah. But also, this is everything I ever wanted. The PS5. Is in... It, it, the yeah. number looks perfect. Yeah. The last time it looked that good was the PS2. Yeah. So they've gone back to the uh, the original day, maybe. But the 5 looks good. Almost looks like, big, you know, the PSS. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, we actually went to EB yesterday and I was like, hey, uh, do you have any more information? They know nothing. They haven't even been given any information. They're not taking pre-orders for anything because they don't know how much anything's going to cost. Yep. Um, all they say is holiday season being Christmas time um, this year. So no one bloody knows anything. They just say subscribe to our emails, which we already are. Yep. And that's it. It's ridiculous. So we're just going to have to wait and see. Yep. All right. Anything else you want to cover before I jump into today's article? No, I'm good. All right. Um, so today we're continuing on with our Seven Ancient Wonders series. And we sh- we're up to the um, statue of Zeus at Olympia. So in terms of references, I sourced some information from today's podcast from Ancient Encyclopedia. Um, not them directly, but they had some fantastic references that I like, went to their article yep. and followed up with. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. And also, I found a fantastic production lecture by Dr. Tom Tartarin. Uh, he was through the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. Um, they have a YouTube channel and they have recorded lectures there. And so um, I can leave the link in the show notes. I will rather not. I can. Um, so feel free to follow that up if you are interested any further. It kind of goes into architecture and kind of other stuff that wasn't really relevant because I'm not covering Olympia as a whole, more so the statue of Zeus at Olympia. Yeah. But if that interests you and the actual breakdown of the archaeology and certain stuff um, that, like, I'm covering some, but it's obviously not going to be, you know, the mythology breakdown. I'm going to go into it a little bit, but not as much depth. So, uh, without further ado, the statue of Zeus at Olympia was a giant seated figure. Um, it's estimated to be about 12.4 or metres, or 41 feet tall, and it was made by the Greek sculptor uh, Phaedes around... 435 BC at the Sanctuary of Olympia, Greece, and it was erected in the Temple of Zeus there. So it was a chryselephantine sculpture sculpture of ivory plates, gold panels, um, mounted onto a wooden framework, and then uh, they actually sat the sculpture on a cedarwood f- uh, throne, which was ornamented with ebony, ivory, gold, and other precious stones. Some people say rubies, some people say sapphires, some people say emeralds, other people say all the gemstones, and blah, blah, blah. Um, So obviously it's one of the seven ancient wonders of the ancient world. That's why we're talking about it today. Um, The statue was lost and was destroyed sometime during the 5th century AD. Um, Details of its form are known only from ancient Greek descriptions and its representations on coins because it was etched into coins. Which is cool. Yeah, so it's partially really sad that there's only like one left. Yeah. You know, I know we say that every week, but it's really sad. Um, so Zeus was obviously worshipped by pilgrims, <laughs> I love that word, from across the Mediterranean, and his statue like inspired countless imitations and apparently he defined the standard representation of Zeus in Greek and Roman art and sculpture on coins, pottery, gemstones. Um, And so all this work has kind of been lost following kind of Roman uh, invasion and things like that and due to Constantinople. Um, But apparently 
this masterpiece captivated the ancient world for a thousand years and because the Olympic Games was held in the Temple of Zeus, yeah. um, it, everyone who went to the Olympics got to see this statue and it was a marvel yeah. decided, right? So, again, to put it all into perspective with the other ancient wonders that we have coloured thus far, the statue of Zeus was built 115 years after the Temple of Artemis. So this is us working backwards, right? So we've got the Temple of Artemis. It's 115 years after that. It's 165 years after the Hanging Gardens and 2,149 years after the Great Pyramids of Giza. So it's it's getting there, right? Absolutely. So um, I want to primarily like to start off with talking more about um, Phaedus, the actual sculptor, if you will. Um, so he was active between 465 and 425 BCE. And he had already supervised the construction of the Parthenon um, in Athens before he started, um, I guess you could say, working on Zeus. And that was between 447 and 432 BCE. And again, everyone knows that Athens is the patron city of Athena. Um, so they all knew that he did fantastic work. So they essentially hired him out to do... Uh, make a monumental sculpture of Zeus. Yeah. And so um, Olympia and Zeus's patronage in Olympia had kind of already been established. If you watch the actual documentary that I've linked, what they basically said is, and I didn't know this, but apparently they had like um, a little like uh, a dirt mound and they dig some steps into it and then there'd be an altar for Zeus, right? Yeah. And so people would go there and they would perform sacrifices, obviously animal, Right, yeah. so whether it be sheep, cattle, whatever, goats, um, and then so they do their sacrifice, and then they would burn the sacrifice, right? And then the ashes over hundreds of years would just build upon each other, yeah, right? And then so the ash pile got seven feet high, which is decent, and then they decided, you know what, we should get that guy to build us a temple. Well, they, we should get the guy to build the sculptor sculpture yep. that's going to be in the temple right and so the idea is is that um you have your altar and then immediately opposite that is where you build your temple right so it's literally in a line yeah but because of Hera already having that structure they didn't have room so they had his altar and then a little ways away also in the olympia complex though grounds they built his um, temple, right? So they decided because they had already like paid patronage to him in Olympia. That's why they decided there. Uh, so pretty much, we know that every four years the Panhellenic Olympic Games were held and dedicated to him. Um, it was controlled by the city, and because it was at a sacred site that already attracted thousands of pilgrims, that also like added to building the Olympic Games to what we know today. And then so, obviously, that's going to call our sports fans from the Mediterranean. I feel so weird saying that, considering, like, oh, my God, 2,000 years ago, people would gather to play sports. But, you know, whatever. And then so, uh, the new cult statue, because, you know, it's technically a cult, but we won't cover that because every religion is technically a cult, but okay. Yep. Um, so, they wanted this beautiful temple to house his statue and you know they really wanted to have a magnificent dedication to Zeus um, because he was such a supreme deity in the ancient Greek religion um, and they only saw it as you know it could only be a positive thing for us even though it's material in nature so they decided that this guy Phaedus was a perfect choice because they knew that he could handle such challenging projects he was able to um, like manage hundreds of craftsmen and he'd shown that he had several years of dedicated work. So he ends up moving to Olympia. Um, and he actually lived on site. And to this day, like, you can actually go and work through the ruins of his workshop. In, That's cool. In the area, right? And so excavations that were completed in the 20th century CE, like I said, um, they dug his workshop out. And they found a simple red figure attic cup or wine jug. Um 
and it etched into it. It was inscribed with Phidio at Emini, which means I belong to Phidias. Uh, apparently they were able to also dig out and identify some ivory tools, a small hammer for working gold, um, and moulds for pieces of a large female statue. Uh, so archaeologists discovered it in the 1950s, and that's when they obviously found some of these tools that he used to create the statue. Um, so just going back to the video, what I found was that, so um, as we covered within the temple, that's where they hosted the Olympic Games. Um, and we've already said how, what it was made out of and how it was just like supposed to be so inspiring and generated awe because he's the father of like, he's the main god, if you will, right? Uh, so what they wanted to represent is him being all powerful, even though he was quite human because he had jealousy. He was known to be filled with rage and with lust and his wife knew of his philandering ways, but he was, um still held in fear and they wanted to represent you know his power of thunder so you can find a lot of pictures of this reconstructed on the internet if you feel so in, um in quite like in, what's the word i'm looking for inclined <laughs> so so his uh statue sat uh square center in the um classical period of greek culture between 490 and 323 bce and this was during the time of democracy for Athens, where cities were known to build statues and temples dedicated to their gods and heroes. Um, but the story of Zeus in Olympia starts during the Dark Age, where, as I said, like there were some early sanctuaries, and that's where they would go to sacrifice um, animals at his altar. That's where he was worshipped for centuries before they decided to... Um, essentially make something dedicated for him where people could go and offer, make their offerings and keep them in something that looked very lavish, which was something they believed he required because of who he was in terms of culture and where he stood. So the formal temple was the most significant change in cult practice during the 8th century. And these monumental buildings functioned to house the cult statue. Uh, so basically, even though the temple itself was said to be absolutely beautiful, it wasn't the temple itself that's on the list. It's the actual statue. Which is... So you can think about, like, the Parthenon in itself. Like, that was supposed to be monumental, yep. you know? A piece of architecture that's phenomenal. Yeah. And you go, we're going to recreate that, but more intense. But that's not the point. It's for the statue that we're going to chuck in the middle of it. Yeah. So everything houses the statue. Yeah. So it's like, you find it interesting that you'd think, oh, if I built a house, it's not to house a statue. I might chuck a statue in a corner. We're not going to build a multi-billion dollar property yep. to house, you know, the Mona Lisa. No. I don't know. I just I but, just found that weird to Yeah, it's comprehend. a weird comparison. You wouldn't build a stadium for one piece of art. Right. Especially in that time. So you can tell how God-driven they were. Yeah. Right? So the temple was constructed in the mid-5th century BC. Um, and this is around the time, like we've spoken before, like there are fewer structures. So that's why these things hit the list. Um, because there wasn't that much around then. So um, it was meant to be constructed between 470 and 456 BC. And this was closely controlled by two historical events. So the reason why it was built at 470 is because um, the local people had won a victory. Like they had a war and they won. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to put that money towards building a temple for Zeus. Right? And then what we know is they found etchings and inscriptions is that it was finished around 456 BC because there are Spartan dedications in the temple's pediment, which is like the base plate of the building. And um, so from the Spartan war over Athens, right? So they put two and two together and they're like, oh, I must have fallen within these periods. So if you go today, all you're going to see are pretty much the remains of the foundation, scatter of columns, and architectural elements. They call the columns drums because yeah. although it stands as one column, instead of having like tiny bricks, 
what they did like to me it looks like massive concrete circles that are quite thick yeah, like, like discs. discs yeah but they call them drums hmm. right so they would put however many drums they wanted together in a pile to make the column if you will right so it looks like if you flicked some dominoes over that's what the drums look like when they're lined up on the ground and so um apparently it looks like that like dominoes fallen over because there was um an earthquake yeah and that shook the foundations that shook the columns and everything kind of just like fell out head over ass right and so if you want to look into the architecture Apparently, it's considered a typical layer, layer of a Greek periptal temple for, and follows all orders of the rules. So basically, outermost, you have the peristyle colonnade, and that means that the columns are kind of surrounding. They're very uniform. They're even on both sides, on the around the outside. And then you have the, um, what's it called? Your... Uh, Ante, which is your pilasters, and so you have four big columns that move in within the room to hold, like the canopy of the room, I guess you could say. And then to the front, you have your pronaus, which is your entry porch. And then to the back of what... So you have the entry porch at the front, but the back version of that is called the opisthamodros, which is a small false porch that contains the treasure room. Yeah. And then, so there's the treasure room, there's a wall, and then on the other side of the wall is where Zeus's cult statue sat. And he sat in the um, cellar, which is, is called the innermost room, and that's where he pretty much sat, ruling over his people in statue form, right? Yep. And so, like, you would think to build like the, the architectural precision... For that day and time. A smart cookie. A very, very How smart cookie. How are they cookie. getting those bloody heavy discs, drums, Probably up? <sighs> Pulleys. Pulleys, yeah. And then lowering them down, maybe. That's insane. Yep. Unless they were some kind of, I don't know, definitely pulley system. <laughs> aliens. <laughs> aliens. <laughs> yeah. All the aliens. So... Basically, looking at the ruins, you can clearly see that the temple was a product of its time. Yep. Uh, we describe like the basic plan of the temple following the peripteral layout, um, where you basically have columns surrounding the entirety of the monument, and you have an innermost room, which you gain entry to from the porch, that, and the room contains the cult statue. And so... Looking at the actual columns themselves, so if you're standing outside the building, basically from roof to the concrete foundations, it's called the Dorich Cannon. So you have the, um, sorry, let me zoom into my words. You have the frisette, which is the little bit just under the roof. Yeah. And so that has like alternating um, carvings, if you will. Yeah. And then just under that, you have like the blank stone. It looks like. It's like, imagine if the ferrazet fer was... Okay, so your your frizet is like your bed sheet. Yep. Right? No, hold on. That's not right. So the top part, the roof, is like the bed sheet. Yep. Then your frizet is like your mattress. And then your architrave is more like your bed base that has yeah. the wheels or your bed frame. Yep. Right? And so the frizet and the architrave together, they're known as the antrabitra. And then you have the column. And as we said, that's composed of drums and it has flutes, which are like bits of whatever they use to actually, um, you know how you have like when you build a model or you're putting wheels on Lego, you need the sticks to slide them onto. Yeah, the technique. Yeah. Yep. So that's what they have there. And then so sitting directly under the columns, you have the stylo bait and under that is a stero bait. So stylo stero. And together they make the platform that the temple is based upon, right? And so what we assume is the temple was about 430 feet long, 95 feet wide, and 68 feet tall. That's pretty damn big. Mm -hmm. So the sculptures that um, of the um, frisette that were facing the west, they um, depicted the Battle of Lapiths and Centaurs. 
and also had etched a statue of Apollo. The um, part of the frisette that was facing the east had sculptures um, depicting a chariot race between Pelops and Onimaios. And at the front and back um, portions of the frisette, frise or whatever the hell it's called, um, they had the 12 labours of Heracles carved in. Um, and apparently a lot of these plates have survived today. And that's how we know what the 12, um, what are they called? Labours actually are. And so the story is that in a brief fit of madness, Heracles killed his wife and six sons. And so to atone for his actions and to be able to grieve, he was required to perform 12 ridiculously difficult tasks. Um, so I thought I actually had an image saying what those tasks were. Did I delete that? Nope, I got them. So oh, uh, essentially after, you know, Heracles killed his wife and six sons. <laughs> Just casual. Yeah, he had to atone for his actions and grieve and was required to perform 12 ridiculously difficult tasks. I thought which I had a were, picture that... One, slay the Nemean lion. Two, slay the nine-headed Lernian hydra. Three, capture the golden hind of Artemis. Four, capture the Eraminthian boar. Five, clean the Aegean stables in a single day. Six, slay the Stymphalian birds. What am I up to? Seven, mm -hmm. capture the Cretan bull. Eight, steal the mares of Diomedes. What am I up to? Nine, mm -hmm. obtain the girdle of Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons. Ten, obtain the cattle of the monster Gerion. Eleven, steal the apples of the Heris... I think it's Hesperides, with the help of Atlas. And then I'm up to eleven, which is capture and bring back Cerberus, the three-headed woof-woof. In my notes, it's a white box. Yeah. I don't know why. Thank you so much for sending yeah, me there. And then um, it goes on to, I suppose, the, the actual statue and what, you know, what it actually looked like. And this is where it starts getting crazy. Because the actual statue, statue um, essentially Zeus had a, a golden crown of olive leaves on his head. Um, he was holding a scepter, and the scepter was surmounted by a golden eagle. The America. America. <clears throat> the clothing, the hair, and the beard was made of gilded glass, potentially, over a wooden model. Um, and in Zeus's right hand, he held a golden ivory Nike, which is... Nike. Nike for victory, Nike shoes, um, which uh, was larger, you know, than life size, of course. And the skin, so as it was made, was a veneer of ivory sheets. So this statue was, you yeah. know, pretty OP. And so um, etched into his actual throne were other symbols. So, you know how you have the bits that may sit on top of your bedposts, yep. like the ornaments? He had those on his throne behind him. And so they depict the three graces and the three seasons. And then if you look to the po parts of the poster, like where his thighs are, where his calves are, and where his feet are, there's a dancing mic on each foot, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> which I laughed at at the time. Um, at the front legs of the throne... Uh, there are sphinxes that are shown to seize Theban children. Um, and below them, we have Apollo and Artemis shooting down Niobe's children. And then at the stool, so the part that his feet are resting on, because they're just raised from the ground, but it's like a block, right? Yeah. Um, there's the there's an image of uh, Heracles battling the Amazons. And the actual base of the throne. Um, I don't think it's called a dais because the statue would sit in the dais, but the dais part of it, right? Um, yep. Depicted mythological scenes. And so today what I found was that apparently um, the statue of George Washington where he's seated and it's in the Smithsonian Museum, that was modelled after the statue of Zeus. But wouldn't it be funny if that was actually the statue of Zeus? And just and modified it a yeah, little bit. Imagine, that. imagine if they put the marble around the wooden yeah. framework. Yeah. But it kind of looks different in terms of the feet placement and the arms. Do you know what I mean? Because the arms are flipped away the other end. So where one arm was up holding the scepter, sorry, down holding the... Yeah, when one arm is up holding the scepter, it's him pointing to the sky. And where he's holding, what does that look like, a scroll? Yeah. Um, 
Or was He's it a holding sword? Nike, yeah, I guess. Or some kind of thing. So what I was next interested in um, was where did they actually find the building materials to essentially make the temple and the statue, right? So we know that the statue is made out of wood, um, and so that's pretty much why it's thought to have been disappeared because it burnt in a fire after like an earthquake, the earthquake, right? Um, so we know that it was built out of gold, ivory, bronze, glass, and various other materials. So the wood was said to be cypress and cedar um, because they're woods that were very um, reputed for the time. The origin of the gold is completely unknown. We do know that there were gold mines in Macedonia, which was a territory not far from the city. But it could have also come from other sources, such as one in Africa, because there were known to be gold mines also running in Africa at the time. You'd like to think it was Macedonia, but... You know, what are you going to do about it? Yep. Uh, so in terms of the building method, of course, it's very hard to figure out how he worked when he built his statue. You know, statue. Uh, specialists aren't really sure when he started, if that makes sense. Uh, we know that the dates of the work in Athens for the realisation of the statue were ordered by Pericles um, between 447 to 438. So a gap of nine years, I guess you could say. So we know that he was there working for almost a decade. So that's a long time, right? Yep, very long time. Uh, we know that uh, Philades hardly ever worked alone. He always had a, ta- a team leader and then that person would command the different... Um, so like there would be a stonemason, there would be a concreter. Not that I'm saying that there was a concreter. And you know what I mean? So a woodworker. So each person had a different... Um, so I guess you could say like the head worker um, was kind of like the foreman, yep. if you will. And then they had team leaders for each individual trade. And then so this was corroborated by um, archaeological research done in his workshop because they found tools for different workers, well, like for different t- different tools for different purposes, which would show that there's different kind of work to be made. And so in his workshop, Apparently, they um, had evidence of his drawings of the project. He um, also had cabinet makers build various parts of the statue. And then they would kind of walk them down the street, for lack of a better term, and actually build it together in the um, temple. So they would build parts, like a build-it-yourself kit, yeah. right? And then they would walk it over or drag it over, whatever they did, to actually assemble the statue in the temple later. And so he carved the ivory thin slices um, to cover the statue where he wanted the skin to be. Um, so because of the statue of Athena had the face of discovery, he wanted Zeus to have more of a torso yeah. because he wanted the statue to have a whole other magnitude. Um, and so he also included, like he wanted the ivory because it was a much more rigid material and he also wanted to show narrow leaves in the crown and all those other aspects. Um, so basically what he did was winding and so he cut everything precisely so it was able to unroll um, the kind of stuff because otherwise the marble would lose, the stuff would lose its rigidity yeah. when they were working with it and all that kind of stuff but it's unknown how that was done um, but apparently we now know that ivory can be manually worked once it's been relaxed yeah. So they obviously would have had some sort of techniques that they use that differ from what we would use today. Uh, so when they fix the ivory plates, they probably would have used some form of their version of glue. And then they would have polished them to mask the, like the plates, I guess yeah. you could, together to the seams to make them not look like separate pieces, but as if the whole statue was made out of one piece. Yeah. And then so, because it wasn't covered completely with ivory or gold, it was painted. And what's known is that Philatus was... Had, he had very good knowledge of painting. Um, apparently, his family member, Panios, um, was able to reproduce scenes of mythology and... He kind of used that as an inspiration for what he wanted to etch into um, the throne, I guess you could say. And so um, no one knows why specifically glass was used on the statue because at the time it was considered to be a very um, expensive material uh, and they thought came from east of the Mediterranean. 
so I don't necessarily know. I was also interested in how much it would cost, whether it be in their turn times or our times, to build and like actually erect the statue. But what I found out is that it's a pretty much a very difficult question to kind of answer because they have not found any document. There is no archaeological source to actually say this is how much it costs or this is how much this amount, like the gold costs this much, the ivory costs this much and that sort of thing or wages cost this much. Um, so because we know what individual materials were used and the preciousness of the metals used and the height of certain parts, um, they can kind of sort of say, look, um, maybe it costs this much because if it's this tall, we could reason that this amount of gold would have been this high and therefore based on today's you know amounts we could say oh maybe it costs this amount of money yep. but no one has any of those values anywhere and so it's kind of because so many people were involved in the project and there were so many hands in the pot because there were so many people involved in not only the building but in different groups you know they might have had 10 people working the stone they might have had five people working on the wood because there were so many people, all those values could be jumbled. Yeah, or skewed. So they say that it's impossible to have details on the cost of erecting the statue. So in terms of destruction, uh, apparently it was the statue was renovated several times. So what they originally wanted to do was repair cracks in the ivory. Uh, they thought that maybe they added supporting columns under the throne. Uh, but there has never been an agreement on the exact cause of the statue's destruction. The uh, Roman Emperor Caligula, uh, Caligula, sorry, he was around, but he reigned between 37 and 41 CE. He had apparently audaciously tried to remove the statue to have it transported to Rome, according to Su uh, Suetonius, uh, who was around between 69 and 140. But apparently the project was abandoned because Zeus mysteriously emitted a roar of laughter and the scaffolding of the workers collapsed. Nah, that's funny. Uh, so what they wanted to do after that, because people were too scared to move it because Zeus had spoken, they tried to remove gold parts. Um, and that was done by Roman Emperor Constantine the First. Jeez. Who ran between 306 and 33. Uh, 337 CE. And so what we do know is that eventually the statue was of Zeus was moved to Constantinople around 395 CE. And at that time, it was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. And uh, the palace it stood in was destroyed during an earthquake. So the actual temple of Zeus was yeah. destroyed during an earthquake, they believe. But some people also say it could have been a tsunami. And then they also say, and um, it's very... What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it, it could have either been the 5th century, it could have been the 6th century, but no one can agree on the time. Yeah. Or whether it had been an earthquake or a tsunami, although most people prefer to say it was an earthquake. However, there is this alternative theory that... Um, is believed to be recorded in um, the works of two historians called Zeronus and Kedron, and that they say that the statue was destroyed by a fire in 475 CE. Really? Which is almost, like, it's, what is that, 80 years yep. after they think that the earthquake or the tsunami occurred, right? But whatever the exact causes of the loss, uh, we know that there are surviving descriptions by people who built it essentially we have some of the panels um and we also know that because we have coins and artworks other artworks that his statue is etched into if you will um so that's kind of all that survives today of this fourth wonder of the ancient world um so apparently the first archaeological work on the site was done by a group of french scientists in 1829 and they were able to locate the outlines of the temple, i.e. I. being the foundations. And they found fragments of sculpture so showing the labours of Hercules. And these pieces were shipped to Paris. And apparently they are still on display today at the Louvre. Wow, that's cool. So a little while later, in 1875, um, some archaeologists from Germany worked 
um, at the site for five summers, so over five years, but they worked exclusively during summer. And over that period, they were able to map out most of the buildings there. So even though, as I said before, it's like a larger site. So he, like uh, his wife is Hera, is in that area as well, um, a short walk away. But there are other buildings within that. I don't want to call it a city. It's more described as a site. So they found more fragments of the temple sculpture. They also found the remains of the pool in the floor that contained oil for the statue. That's cool. And then almost a century later, in the 1950s, an excavation uncovered the workshop of Phaedus, uh, and that was found underneath an early Christian church. So hmm. The Christians were like, nah, none of this heretic bullshit. Let's whack our, whack our own church yep. on top of the site. Um, and that's where they found his workshop. And in there, like we described earlier, they found some sculptor's tools. Apparently they found a pit for casting bronze some clay moulds, modelling plaster, and even a portion of one of the elephant's tusks that had been hoarded to essentially use for ivory. Yeah. To essentially tack onto the statue. Um, apparently they use these clay moulds clay molds to shape gold, and uh, they actually had serial numbers which were used to show the place of the plates in the design. That's cool. Which... Could you imagine looking at that? that Surviving would... centuries later. That's crazy in itself. Yeah. Uh, so there is... Like, you can find tons of pictures online. I found this picture of the 19th century um, expedition where you just see all these men just l leisurely lying across and sitting on or standing on the, the drums. Yeah. Right? So apparently today the stadium at the site has been restored, but there is literally next to nothing left of the temple um, except for a few of the columns that have fallen on the ground um, and as we said the statue is completely gone I wouldn't be surprised if parts of it are in collectors like private collections yeah, if they survived yeah. so now I'll leave you with a question which I'll obviously like you to answer do you think that the Greek government should rebuild or perform a reconstruction they should on the site or do you think it should be made out of something like lasers well like if it was done if it was done like cool a projection that, that would survive any kind of future yeah that's what cool. i was thinking yeah it would be complex to do like a hologram yeah yeah that would be cool that would look very cool right but you know greece no disrespect because whatever but you know Greece is quite in debt so yeah. I can't see them doing that and how long do you reckon in today's time would it take to rebuild something like a Parthenon I'd say probably 10 20 years still you reckon yeah like that's like pretty you know crazy that kind of but trying to recreate it the way they yeah. did it imagine if they tried to keep the same drums to form the same columns and in roughly the same spot that would be cool incorporated in yeah that would look cool That'd be very, very hard to do. Do you think they should do what they did at Stonehenge where, like, if you can tell that these drums formed a column, that they should make that column and, like, stick some random pole through it so it stands up, kind of like they did at Stonehenge where they rearranged it, or do you think it's better just to leave it on the ground and be like, this is what it was? This is what it was, and then on a different, like, like next to it, build the... One, actual, yeah. reconstruct one with the yeah. drums that Or even been. small scale. Yeah. Yeah, do it that way. Yeah, that's what I think. Hmm, very, very cool. My brain can't fathom it being that old. Yeah, it's ridiculously, you know. Ancient. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah it's just, just a pity all this has been destroyed. Imagine if it was still standing. It was the pyramids. Yeah. What's left of them? Yeah. People mm. say that it'll... I hate to quote that Ted's... What's that? The chocolate wafers... But then they put Snickers in there. Oh, uh, yep, yep. What are those things called? Pets? Jeds? Um, blank. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking chocolate uh, now. Snickers chocolate drop. Picnic? No. <sighs> oh, uh... You know what I'm talking about? I, I saw them on, um... What's that dumb thing called? The internet? 
Yeah, on Uber Eats for one of the... Hold on. I know what it's called. But anyway, in the ad, they're like, uh, the, the pyramids of Giva, Giza bridge to outlast civilization itself. Yeah. Unlike, and then they have the product. Hmm. Oh, crap. Where is... I need to find the freaking BP petrol station in the body. What are you? No. Couch food. BP Bandura. Crip, crip, crip. I know it's here. Hold on. I know it's here because I saw it the other... Pods, bro. Pods. Pods. Them. Yeah, those Snickers pods. Mars yeah, and pods, they have yeah. Mars bars too. And they're freaking addictive. And they sell them at... They used to sell, I don't, We haven't been to Hoyt's in a while. But yeah. I know they sell them at Hoyt's. They sell them there at over, you know, overpriced prices. Okay, the favourite ones are the Snickers ones, but they're freaking expensive for such a small bag. Yeah, they are. So um, I apologise that that turned into an advert... Uh, uh, not so... <laughs> no, that was a good one. Ancient advertisement. But it's just really sad, this stuff. You know? It's just all gone. Yeah. yeah. Wait a minute, what do you think of that one? I like that. How... Like, we've covered... What have we covered thus far? We've covered the Great Hang- Pyramid. The... We've covered the Hanging Gardens. Yep. Artemis. Yep. And now Zeus. So how majestic do you think Zeus is in comparison to the others? I think the Hanging Gardens pretty much are the ones that would have been the most OP. You reckon? Yeah, I think to see that, that would have been an absolute oasis. Structurally, the pyramids with all the quartz and whatever else they put on it, it would have just... To see that from miles and miles away. Retrospectively, I think the lighthouse at Alexandria... Yeah. Because it was burnt down and destroyed the library, which I guess we should cover the library in a further episode. But architecturally, you have to appreciate the pyramids. They're still around. Yeah. Right? But also, the Colossus at Rhodes, the freaking guy, one foot on each side of the port, yeah. holding the lantern. How does that work? Yeah. That's, How did they build that? That's crazy. Unless they carved it all into the rock. Yeah. So I guess we'll figure that out when we go to cover that episode in the while in a few weeks um yes do you have anything else you want to add no that's pretty straightforward archaeological you know you know just novelty just pushes the boundary of archaeological mm. ingenuity now we have to go to the louvre to see the base plates yes of heracles is um yeah club labors that'd be cool if you were heracles um what would you want to essentially like what would your favorite labor out of them be um, to attempt. Cerberus. Yeah, four head, three headed dog. Yeah, yeah. three headed doggy. You just pat it and roll over and be like, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> throw, throw the ball. Throw <laughs> the ball. But would you need three balls? No. It's the one. But it's a three headed dog. Yeah, but they can only really chase one. Yeah, but it's got three heads. Yeah, but it can chase one. They can but ch- only one would be able to get it. Well, what about a three balled ball? Mm. Big chew toy. Three balls on a rope. There you go. Done. Mm. Problem solved. Very unhappy doggy, but, you know, serve us. Yeah. yeah. Which makes me wonder why the HMS Cerberus isn't three ships. There's a HMS Cerberus? Yes. Interesting. Th- the more you know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a HMS Cerberus. Yes, there is. Yeah. It's a base. Her Majesty's Victorian ship. A breastwork monitor that served in the naval forces. There you go. The Commonwealth Naval Forces and the Royal Australian Navy between 1971 and 1924. There we go. Apparently it's at Beach Road, Black Rock. Ooh. In Victoria. Yeah. So it's just out in the bay. Yeah, out in the bay. Cerberus is out in the bay. How do they do that? <laughs> Probably. Do they deliberately sink it? Yes. But you can still see part of it. Yes. So why did they do that? Because, uh, you know, ships get scuttled. That's basically what they do, you know. They can't really do anything about it. So, uh, yeah. You know, you can... We should go. Yeah, it's basically just a historic shipwreck. Can you dive it? Uh, potentially. Obviously. Oh, I don't know what sharks are. What bay is it in? Um... <laughs> Port Phillip. <laughs> 
Oh my god, it's East Sandringham, so it's really eastern suburbs. Yeah. Yeah, of course. It's Beach Port Road, Blackrock Vic, three one nine three. I'll tell you what, right? We'll go in the afternoon, take some cool sunset Instagram pictures, become internet famous, and then pull a Al Darby, go to one of the restaurants and say, yo, uh, we're Instagram famous, and you have to give us our dinner for free. Yeah, pretty much. That would work. So, uh, yeah, no, Cerberus is just sitting there. People have, you know, vandalised it. What the hell? Yeah, that's what people How do. How far out is it? Into the water. Do you get what I mean? Um, from the pier yeah. to the water, it's about, it looks maybe, what, 400 metres? God. It's pretty close. Very, very close. So, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it looks like a decent wreck too. But, you know, obviously, it doesn't have a lot of stuff in it that it, originally had it's all been you know salvaged oh uh, it was put there as a breakwater oh there you go for the black rock yacht club oh huh, cool so uh during her life cerberus never left port phillip bay and never fired in anger huh. she sits approximately 10 feet or 3.0 meters of water less than 650 feet or 200 meters for sure breakwater became a popular site for scuba diving and it's penetrable because there's many openings along both sides. It's got two submerged deck levels with heavy suit sitting. Uh, apparently, with heavy care and lights, it's possible to travel from stern to stern without leaving the ship. Well, there you go. The interior of the ship has also seen use as a training course for assault swimmers. Wow. And people use her assault, her exposed decks for picnics. Well, there you go. Very cool indeed. So, there's some really cool... So, are they saying that I could waddle over there? Yeah, you could swim over to it and then climb up onto it. Would I get fined for doing that? I don't know. That's something you probably have to find out beforehand. So, uh, it's essentially the case of, you know, you go in and you can see where the uh, conning tower used to be and, you know... Where the different guns are. Do you think it leached? It's obviously leaching shit into the ocean, though, right? Possibly. I mean, obviously they would have cleared the fuel tanks or whatever. But um, yeah, there's probably something going on. But uh, yeah, very very interesting. And, so uh, pretty cool. Something to do. But um, you know, people kind of get a little bit scrappy over OH and S. So, uh, so it is illegal? No, because there was an interesting thing back in 2017 where they were looking at uh, potentially concrete filling it. So uh, essentially they were going to put in safety works and everything because, you know, people, you know, going into it. So essentially what they wanted to do uh, was, you know, they'd look at it and go, well, think of putting concrete in the pyramids. Essentially what you're doing, there's already corrosion going on to the hull because it's in seawater. So essentially if you were to put concrete, that would add extra weight, which would then decrease the stability of the wreck, which would then just crush it. Want to know something? Yeah. On the 25th of July, 2019, it was added to the shipwreck protected zones. Yeah. And it forms one of the nine shipwreck protected zones in Victoria. Ooh. So you have to apply for a permit to access. Well, there we go. The Cerberus. That's interesting. Um, Which is, you know, what they should be, you know, doing, protecting stuff like that. Because a lot of the older stuff these days is just, you know, destroyed. Heritage of Victoria are not issuing permits to enter the protected zone of HMV as Cerberus due to safety reasons. The hull is in imminent danger of collapse and there is risk of entrapment and drowning if caught inside the hull. Jeez. So now it's purely just... So there's a 0 0.5 hectare rate rectangle around the Cerberus that you can't go within. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's uh, interesting to know. Devo! So, yep, yeah, so it looks like we're not going there. Devo! 
Because it's like, oh, the water's pretty shallow. And I'm like, okay, like, I'd be fucking pissing myself for sharks. Yeah. But I could hightail it there. I could swim there in, like, 200 meters. How big is a pool again? 50 meters? Yep. That's how long it is. Swimming lessons were, like, a quarter of a pool, right? A half a pool. So, 25 meters. If I can do 25 meters in about 30 seconds. Yeah. What? Right? 25, and they're saying it's 200 meters. So, what's 25 times by 8? It's like, what? 200? Sorry, no, no, that's not right. What's, what's 30 times by 8? 8, 16, 240. So, what you're saying is in less than 10 minutes, I could be out there. Yes, easily. I'm not saying do it. But, like, it sounds pretty cool. Yeah. I wouldn't climb it. I wouldn't go any... Oh, shit, but what if there's shit in there? And, like, it would cut you because you've got nowhere to run. It's not like you can run away from shit in your head. Right? Let's just look at it f- with our feet on the ground. Yeah. We'd have to do it that way. Yeah. Hmm. Devo. But also not Devo. No. Because safety. Then there's some really cool wrecks out there. Yeah. All right. That's it from me today. Yeah, no, that was cool. Um, sorry, it's a bit more of a small podcast compared to the last two yep. that I've prepped, but I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, and let us know if you want us to explore any wrecks, like some really, you know, conspiracy wrecks. Is into podcast? Yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. Well, actually, if you're interested, I have set up a document cool. where you can um, recommend topics for us. Yeah. So if there is one, yeah, be sure it. to let us know. Done. So, uh, yeah, that was cool. Yep. All right, that's it for me. Yep, that's all for me. So, uh, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thank you very much for listening. It hope was you're all having good. a fantastic rest of your weekend. I yeah. hope you have a fantastic week. Hope your vision is 2020 still. Yeah, well, it's only been a week in. <laughs> um, this episode is going up on the 12th. We are currently the 7th. Um, and I guess we're going to go finish this, save it. And then uh, we're going to go watch some of the gloaming. Yeah, the gloaming. We've got to crank through this series. We're we'll watching an episode or two tonight. Yeah, done. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. So, well, on that note, we shall see you later. Full Metal Chicken, uh, I'm out. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Steph and Business Controllers and Catchers signing off for yes. this episode. Thanks Bye-bye. for uh, listening. And uh, for anyone who's watching, um, well, how did you manage that? This is audio. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching us on YouTube, Tell us how you found our podcast. Yeah, that'd be interesting. We'd like to know. How did you find it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's us. Thanks, guys. Next time. Bye. Bye.